So as you've heard, this next session is going to focus exclusively on the ICCPR and the Human Rights Committee's review of the United States implementation of the ICCPR, and this is an ongoing process and in the United States being um, organized by the U.S. Human Rights Network, um, including through its uh, chairs of the ICCPR task force, one of whom is Jamil Dakwar, who we have with us today. Um, as you have already heard, <laughs> he is the director of the ACLU's Human Rights Program um, in the National Office in New York, and as I just mentioned, um, very much involved with the U.S. Human Rights Network's work. Jamil has a long history uh, as an attorney and advocate working with organizations uh, here in the United States, but also abroad, um, and looking at really a range of issues uh, from national security to discrimination, um, all kinds of issues from a human rights perspective, um, as you might expect from an organization like the ACLU. So he is going to spend the next uh, 30 or so minutes talking about this ongoing process, explaining where we are, what's been done. Uh, then we'll have 10 or so minutes for questions. Then we'll break up into two groups, which, which Jamil will explain. Uh, and then we'll have a reporting back session so that we can make this as uh, interactive and as engaging as possible and hear from you um, and let you hear from your colleagues about how you can participate in this process. Thanks, Jamil. Thanks so much, uh, Lisa, and uh, thank you for organizing uh, and the staff of uh, the IGRC for, st for organizing this wonderful training. Uh, uh, I think IGRC has been really doing an outstanding work, and it's, uh, this is just another uh, uh, way of reflecting on the uh, fantastic uh, uh, work coming, um, uh, that's coming from this organization. So I'm really happy to be here and to be part of the organization as well. Um, I wanted to, to kind of may take the 30 minutes or maybe 35, 40 minutes to, to speak specifically about the ICCPR. You've heard from experienced advocates about uh, the UN human rights mechanism, uh, both the treaty-based human rights uh, mechanisms as well as the UN charter-based mechanisms like the Human Rights Council and uh, special rapporteurs, special procedures. Uh, we thought that this would be a great op uh, opportunity to share with you the ongoing work that's going on right now in this country, uh, trying to use the ICCPR to hold the U.S. accountable to treaty obligations under this covenant. So I'll be spending the time just giving you um, a brief summary of the ICCPR uh, and then speak a little bit more about the process of civil society and NGOs coordination and participation in this process. Uh, I just wanted to start by asking two quick questions, if you, if you don't mind. How many of you have not heard of the ICCPR uh, before this training? And be honest. Okay, that's good. How many of you have used the ICCPR in your practice or in your advocacy? <laughs> now, this is exactly what we're going to try to do here. We're going to try to bridge the gap between your knowledge and your, um, you know, your practice, whether you are an, a practicing attorney or you're an advocate uh, using the human rights or want to use the human rights more in your work. Uh, I think this is uh, this day and a half, as well as other opportunities in the future, will give you uh, the chance to do so. So let me just start with, uh, with the ICCPR. So as it was mentioned earlier, the ICCPR, the International Covenant Civil Political Rights, is one of the uh, foundational documents that the United Nations adopted uh, in the early years. The ICCPR itself went into force in 1976. It was uh, ad uh, si adopted by the UN in 1966. Uh, the United States has been a state party to the ICCPR since 1992. So it's like over 23 years uh, uh, state party, and in fact, championed the ICCPR globally. Uh, you, you could go to the State Department website and see how many times in the daily briefings of the State Department, uh, the spokeswoman or spokesperson uh, would cite the ICCPR as uh, one of the obligations that other governments should uh, 
uh, uphold in the treatment or in their behaviors, particularly with regard to civil and political rights. Uh, the ICCPR, with the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted in 1948, but is not a uh, legally, uh, legally binding document, uh, really form what is called the International Bill of Human Rights. And uh, subsequently, many other treaties were adopted, um, including CERD, as you heard before, the, the, uh, uh, the other uh, specific thematic uh, uh, treaties like the Convention Against Torture, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, discri the, this, the CRPD, the Disability Rights Convention, the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, and more recently you've had uh, two additional uh, uh, treaties that obviously barely get mentioned you mentioned that there would be, why would there be any uh, media attention to the international human rights work and law, uh, you know, treaties like the, the rights of uh, migrant workers and families and their families barely known in the United States is a, is a one that has been adopted by the UN. Unfortunately, uh, this, the ratification process is going very slowly and, and it's not, uh, um, um, it's, it's, it's obviously one of those uh, treaties that the U.S. Is, is not going to ratify anytime soon, unfortunately. Similarly, with uh, a more recent uh, treaty on uh, banning um, or prohibiting enforced disappearances uh, that was really championed by France and it's now um, an acti active uh, or went into force with the treaty body in, in Geneva starting to work. But the ICCPR really looks at a wide range of civil and political rights. And I want to go through quickly through those rights. You may, I think you may have a copy of the ICCPR in your materials. So you should definitely look at the specific provisions in some of those provisional articles very detailed. So I'm going to give you, in a nutshell, what it really covers. So the ICCPR has um, a number of articles, starting with the right to self-determination for peoples in Article 1. Uh, in, uh, in Article 2, it goes to the scope and the wh where does it apply. And it says the application is really all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction without distinction such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Uh, remember, the other status is something that's been used more frequently by advocates recently to highlight the fact that uh, international human rights is broader than just the classes that are being specified, and particularly when you deal with LGBT rights. Okay, that's, so it's not in this, it's in the C, on the CD, but it's not in the handout. So you gotta take my word for the, <laughs> <laughs> for what's on there. Uh, one, in, one thing I wanna mention here is that, uh, and we will mention it a little bit later, the, the US, uh, has argued before the Human Rights Committee the first time that it appeared in the mid-90s, as well as the most recent appearance b by the Bush administration in 2006, that the ICCPR applies only to U.S. territory. It doesn't apply extraterritorially. So even in Guantanamo, uh, the ICCPR has no relevance, it's not applicable. Uh, even if you go beyond Guantanamo to other countries and areas where the U.S. has uh, uh, operations and certainly r uh, over the past decade ran detention facilities. The, the U.S. argued, I think, uh, in, in, in with not much support from the international community that uh, it, it, the ICCPR doesn't apply. Obviously, that's something that will be one of the things that will be raised by the committee and we'll come back to it. Another ar important article is gender equality under Article 3, uh, then the right to life. Uh, which is an important concept and an article um, where uh, there's a prohibition against taking the life, uh, but with a, with a specific uh, wording that has been an opener, opening for many governments, including the U.S. government, to argue uh, that the death penalty, even though the right to life should be protected, the death penalty has not been per se prohibited by the ICCPR. Uh, only when 
the right deprivation of, liber of life is, uh, as is done arbitrarily, then that would be a violation of the right to life. And in, in fact, you have to remember that the ICCPR was adopted in 1966. The death penalty or um, abolition movement has been in just in the beginning of its uh, life and its uh, momentum. So uh, there was few countries that have banned uh, or abolished the death penalty and they, ha they crafted an exception to the use of the death penalty. So they said, well, death penalty will be allowed to be used or imposed, but with uh, some conditions. And conditions are they have to be for the most serious crimes, uh, but they added not on children, not on women when they are pregnant. Uh, the Article 6 also says that there, there's a right to seek pardon or commutation if sentenced to the death by the state. Um, and, and that's obviously something that we'll come back to it when we talk about how the U.S., uh, when it ratified the ICCPR, how it really accepted uh, or did not accept those obligations. Article 7 goes to emphasize the importance of the prohibition against torture, cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment. Uh, this is an important article because for the first time, it was the prohibition against torture and at the same time, cruel, inhumane, degrading treatment were in the same article of the convention. If you compare it to the convention against torture, there's two, s the separation between prohibition against torture and then cruel and humane degrading treatment. The, in the ICCPR, they are in, in one provision and the states and governments uh, uh, are not permitted to derogate from this right. Meaning even in a time of emergency, um, there's an armed conflict situation or civil unrest uh, the co government has still has to abide by this, by this article as well as many articles uh, that are specifically uh, restricted to be derogated from. The article eight talks about uh, prohibitions on slavery and servitude. Obviously, this is an, uh, the article where, which covers trafficking, both sex and labor trafficking, and you will see that the, the Human Rights Committee raised this issue with the US, US government. Uh, and then Article 9 uh, addresses the right to liberty and security of persons, uh, due process protections and arrest and detention, and freedom of arbitrary detention. Uh, Article 10 uh, goes into, into looking at uh, the right of all persons deprived of liberty. And here, the, the concept of deprivation of liberty is broader than just people who are in jails and prisons. It's really in all detention facilities uh, and, and in, in subsequent guidance by, by the U.S., uh, by the U.N. Um, General Assembly uh, specifically talks about immigration detention, um, uh, facilities that are not necessarily uh, uh, punitive uh, in, in their nature. So the importance of protecting some uh, person's uh, uh, rights even when they are in, de in, in, in detention and, and this, this very powerful language of a treatment of persons with humanity and with respect for the inherent dignity of a human person. Uh, Article 12 uh, specifically looks at the right of movement and choice of residence. This is an article where uh, uh, a number of organizations have cited where there's a restrictions on the right of movement. Uh, for example, in the, in the context of the so-called war on terror, all the uh, issues of no-fly uh, lists, people are uh, prevented from boarding planes because they are on no-fly list, that would be something that would invoke this kind of article. Um, equality and recognition before the law, obviously this is, this is something that where uh, uh, a number of, of uh, advocates have used to argue that you can't really uh, place somebody outside the protection of the law. Everybody should be recognized as a human being, particularly in the context of uh, immigrants' rights uh, and pe undocumented persons. Uh, that's one of the most powerful articles to argue for this. Then uh, fair trial uh, uh, rights and procedural guarantees under Article 14 um, uh, is another article that is cited to look at uh, criminal uh, procedures and criminal justice system, including other tribunals. It doesn't have to be only uh, criminal uh, justice system. It could be also a tribunal, military tribunal, for example, the military commissions that are now at Guantanamo. Um, uh, one of the things that the international community has criticized the U.S. by failing to meet uh, Article 14 protections of fair trial. And then we, uh, you have specific um, 
protections of privacy, obviously very relevant to these days, uh, the uh, freedom from arbitrary and unlawful interference with privacy, family, or correspondence under Article 17, uh, and then freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, Article 18, and moving to the freedom of speech, and uh, right to hold opinions, and freedom to seek, receive, and impart information. Uh, and there's an interplay between the freedom of expression and freedom of privacy. Uh, just last week, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression issued a landmark report on the, uh, the surveillance uh, program. Uh, I think he, he didn't anticipate, obviously, that the, the, the NSA um, uh, files or the NSA surveillance program will be in the news, but uh, he did talk uh, in a very thorough and comprehensive way about the limitations on the right of freedom of expression and uh, on privacy, citing Article 17 and Article 19 of the ICCPR. And then obviously for many, many of uh, advocates in the United States, particularly in the last couple of years, the right of peaceful assembly, uh, the Occupy protest, something that we will come back to when we get to the U.S. report. Uh, freedom of association is also covered in Article 22. Uh, this is an important article when you talk about um, uh, groups of workers uh, as well as uh, just organizing uh, and, and to the extent that the, the government has to respect their right to associate and uh, as uh, other groups have. Then Article 23 and 24 uh, address issue of marriage and family rights. Again, uh, you have to keep in mind that this is a, a treaty that was conceived in the 1960s or 50s, 60s, and it was important for many governments to, to uh, uh, to address and to emphasize uh, social rights and social uh, values such as marriage and family rights. And so they are addressed specifically in Article 23. And then uh, Article 24, the right to nationality for children. You can see that a lot of those articles mirror uh, provisions and articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And there's also an influence, uh, the ICCPR was influenced by the European Convention on, on Human Rights, which, which was adopted in the early 50s. And lastly, two uh, articles, 25 and 27, uh, the right to participate in civil life, especially through voting and public service, uh, clearly an important one for, for the U.S. review given the uh, suppression, uh, voter, voter suppression laws that were passed in a number of states um, in the country. Uh, and the Article 27 uh, emphasizes the right of minority groups to express and participate in their cultural groups and practices. Uh, this is one of the articles was cited by the committee to look at ethnic, linguistic, national, and sometimes even indigenous communities. Although the indigenous communities and indigenous peoples uh, reject the, the, the categorization or their uh, protection as a minority group, but nevertheless, the committee has taken a number of uh, issues and addressed them in, in, in that regard. So it's important that it will be read uh, with the right to self-determination as well as other articles under the third and other uh, important human rights treaties, particularly the, you know, you know, the UN Declaration on the Rights of uh, Indigenous Peoples. Now, after, well, w first when the ICCPR first was adopted, there was another protocol uh, op called optional protocol because that was not something that all governments had to, to ratify or adopt when they adopt the ICCPR. The first one, gave the Human Rights Committee, which we, we, you probably heard it before and we will talk a bit more about it, has the, the right, uh, the governments will give the Human Rights Committee uh, the, the jurisdiction to, um, uh, to hear individual communication, individual cases brought by citizens and residents and people affected by uh, uh, government policies after they exhausted domestic remedies. And this is a, an op optional protocol that was adopted with the ICCPR in 1976 and went into force and 114 state parties uh, as of today. The U.S. is not party, does not accept this procedure. So even if you exhausted all remedies, you can take an individual case to the Human Rights Committee. The second optional protocol, which was um, uh, adopted later on, uh, was... Um, one that looked specifically at death penalty. And uh, as of today, 76 state parties under this second optional protocol accepted the abolition of the death penalty with no restrictions, with no uh, limitations. So it would be basically 
uh, rejecting the death penalty and um, and, and obviously, not many, you know, 76 out of the 193 members of the United Nations, so you're still uh, uh, speaking about a fair amount of governments and countries that still retain the death penalty, although many states that have not accepted the optional protocol uh, and have the death penalty on their books uh, uh, have a moratorium that is a de facto abolition of the death penalty. Here's the interesting part. So all of, all of you know, the rights under the ICCPR sound great, and the only problem is that governments don't like to place limitations, restrictions on their ability to exercise their power. And the notion of the international uh, community or through adoption and negotiating treaties come to a specific countries and say, well, we don't like, we have to tell you that we don't like particular policies, particular laws that you have is something that many countries have resisted. And the U.S., I think, is, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, um, is one of the major countries that have um, resisted accepting uh, the United international human rights law and treaties uh, by arguing that there are certain uh, limits that would not be constitutional under the U.S. Constitution, or the U.S. laws and practice would not be uh, conforming to the treaty, and therefore they had to enter what we call reservations, understanding, and declarations. And when the U.S. adopted the ICCPR in 1992, it entered, um, it entered um, five reservations, five understandings and three declarations. And they were mentioned briefly earlier um, in the previous panel. I wanted to cite the most important ones because I think they really have an impact on, s on some of our work and limited our ability to fully use the ICCPR as well as other treaties in domestic uh, advocacy. First, the U.S. claimed that uh, protection of free speech under the U.S. Constitution should not be affected by any limitations, restrictions that, that are, are imposed by the ICCPR, and you've heard before also about CERD. Um, and I think uh, there is a, some consensus or more acceptance of the fact that the U.S. laws in general on, under the First Amendment offers more protection for free speech and, first, and, and uh, freedom of ex expression. However, uh, in reality, this is, this is obviously not uh, the case always the case. The second uh, reservation addressed the issue of the imposition of the capital punishment, the death penalty. And uh, at the time when the U.S. accepted or adopted the, the ICCPR 1992, uh, execution of children and juveniles was, uh, was still legal. Uh, so they had to make an exception to say, well, uh, we still think that we have the right under the ICCPR, even though the ICCPR clearly uh, makes it illegal or unacceptable to execute juveniles, the U.S. had to enter this reservation, which was objected by many countries at the time. Uh, and unfortunate, fortunately, the U.S. Supreme Court outlawed the execution of ju juveniles. However, this reservation is still um, uh, remains intact. The U.S. has not withdrew this reservation, even though as a matter of law and practice, um, we, we don't execute juveniles. Um, but that's just to tell you how these kinds of things remain uh, in, in place. The other important reservation that was entered is limiting the prohibition uh, against cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment uh, to the prohibition uh, under the 5th, 8th, and 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So basically, the U.S. government said, we, we don't really uh, understand the, the, w the way that we accept this obligation is only uh, under our, under our uh, interpretation and U.S. Supreme Court case law under the 5th, uh, 8th, and 14th Amendment, uh, with particularly with the 8th with the Amendment uh, cruel and unusual punishment prohibition. So that obviously creates a gap between U.S. law and practice and international standards. And you can see why the U.S. Uh, over the years really have become an outlier 
uh, in the area of uh, abuse against uh, prisoners or um, um, uh, because simply because there's a, a very limited influence and impact or respect for international standards with regard to the treatment of persons uh, who are in liberty, particularly from abuse. Uh, that could be exploitation of any kind, sexual exploitation, mental torture as well. Psychological torture would be, uh, would be banned, although when it's short of torture under the Convention Against Torture or under, under the ICCPR, the U.S. has the limitation of the 5th, 8th, and 14th Amendment. The last one I want to emphasize is the limits on the treatment of juveniles as adults. This is an area where a number of jurisdictions, a number of states continue to have, uh, an, as well as the federal government, is continue to have a serious problems with meeting international standards where juveniles should not be treated as adults in the criminal justice system. Uh, the second way that the U.S. basically conditioned its, uh, its uh, obligations under the ICCPR by uh, accepting or um, putting forward an understanding. And that's really the, uh, what we call the federalism understanding. Uh, and the federal, and federal, you know, if you read the text of this understanding, it's, uh, it's really hard to get, I mean, you, I think we read it positively in a way that uh, it makes sense. Although, unfortunately, in practice, this federalism uh, understanding has impeded uh, the ability of of, of uh, state and local governments or limited their way that the ICCPR would be applicable on the state and lo local level. And by that I mean, if you read what it says, it, sh it shall be implemented, the ICCPR shall be implemented by the federal government to the extent that it exercises legislative and judicial jurisdiction over the matters covered by the treaty. And otherwise by state and local government, but with what this is uh, basically the paraphrasing, the end, but with support from the federal government for the fulfillment of the covenant. So I think the federalism uh, understanding, although it appears to be uh, negative, I think it should be read in a way that would encourage state and local governments to, to apply and implement, and they do have uh, obligations under international law, regardless of the federalism structure, to implement the ICCPR. But there is another important element here, which is that the federal government is not off the hook it can't just say, oh, we don't have jurisdiction on state and local governments because we, we don't control prisons and jails in California. They still have an obligation under international law to make sure that the, the state and local government are meeting their obligations and assist them in carrying their obligations, something that the federal government over the last, last 23 years failed to do, and there's an ongoing advocacy uh, to address this failure and it will be discussed uh, and I think over the next uh, sessions. The last thing quickly I want to mention is the declarations that the U.S. government entered and they were mentioned earlier, the one on non-self-executing, uh, which is uh, really uh, I think one of the major obstacles for uh, mainly lawyers and litigators to use the ICCPR. Uh, in, uh, in, in directly invoking the ICCPR as, as a, uh, in litigation. And I think the, the reason goes back to the fact that the, that the ICCPR, when it was adopted, ratified by the Senate, uh, the Senate made it clear that it's not self-executing. So you can't really enforce it directly in, in, um, in court, uh, and it doesn't raise uh, 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 individual or uh, private cause of action uh, uh, as part of that process. And the truth is, while this could have been reasonable, you know, when you ratify a treaty, what, what should have followed after the adoption of the treaty in 1992, acts of, of Congress and state legislatures to effectuate the treaty obligations. So that to say, well, we you know, we didn't have a chance, we didn't have the time to, to, to pass legislation that would make the different rights that we, what we looked at um, enforceable in, in our courts, but we will do so as we pass more legislation, as we amend and modify our legislation. This is the one of the biggest failure, really, of the U.S. government, uh, uh, the federal, U.S. Congress, and state legislatures, the failure uh, to take uh, an action. And I think uh, there's two things to blame. One is there's not much um, awareness. There's need to be more awareness of that. 
uh, there's going to be more campaigning and pressure on, gov on, on the U.S. government and all levels to do so, but also responsibility ultimately of those governments. And so you will hear more about uh, very interesting initiatives that are going on in different states, particularly here in the state of, of California. Uh, so that just to put everything in context, so the ICCPR is part of this uh, huge human rights uh, system in the UN where you can see the US is only partially participating in those uh, treaty bodies. You know, uh, you mentioned, uh, was er mentioned earlier, the ICERD on the left hand, uh, social economic rights, forget about it, this is not a relevant thing. Uh, ICCPR, um, uh, obviously, uh, is, is one treaty body, CEDAW, the U.S. signed it 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, in the, uh, uh, the Carter administration. And despite the fact that there were several hearings on, uh, in Congress, has yet to ratify it. Similarly, CAT is one of the few. It was ratified in 1994, um, and uh, it's being used by advocates to particularly address issues of uh, torture and, and cruel and inhumane degrading treatment. CRC, only the optional protocols, the one on children in armed conflict, and the second on uh, 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 sex trafficking and pornography is the one where the Committee on the Rights of the Child has the chance or has the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the authority to review U.S. records. And then, uh, obviously, we, we are far from uh, ratifying the International Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers and their Families, and the, the last one that I mentioned, which went into force in 2006, the CPAD, um, and, but may perhaps in the next few years, uh, although I, I'm not very optimistic, the CRPD could very well be the next treaty to be ratified. Um, I think you heard much about you know, what the treaty bodies do. So the ICCPR and the Human Rights Committee is the body that monitors compliance with the ICCPR. It considers reports that are submitted under the ICCPR. Uh, it considers individual, individual complaints. That's not an option for the U.S. It adopts general comments, an important way to interpret and to clarify state obligations under the treaty. And general comments, uh, I think the, the Human Rights Committee adopted uh, uh, more than 30 comments so far. Uh, conduct inquiries, uh, specifically some treaty treaties uh, provide uh, jurisdiction for, for, for the treaty bodies to do that. Um, you also mentioned this, so I'm going to go briefly through this. Uh, the Human Rights Committee, just like other treaty bodies, uh, is really a collection of independent experts. You have 18 members, including one member from the United States. They are nominated by their governments, but they are not representing their own countries. They usually really uh, meet in independent standards and uh, competencies, so they're not supposed to be uh, biased representing their government's views, although there are uh, obviously exceptions to that where governments uh, nevertheless appointed diplomats to sit on the committee while they're actually acting as diplomats or ambassadors to Geneva, well, maybe just to save cost perhaps, uh, or, or all kinds of uh, things. But by and large, and I think over the overwhelming situations, these independent experts really are uh, people who, who have um, expertise in the particular treaty and the ICCPR uh, looking specifically on civil political rights. Um, that they are four-year terms. Uh, they meet in Geneva and New York, although the New York meetings are less um, frequent because of budgetary uh, issues, so they are meeting most of the time in Geneva. And uh, they are supported by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So here's where, uh, you know, you've heard that some uh, questions were raised earlier about how to get involved and what really this process about shadow reporting and how advocates and civil society can participate in all of this. Because in essence, governments take those, these obligations. They are obli obliged, uh, they are uh, obligated to, to submit periodic reports. But these committees really are normally understaffed. Uh, there may be a couple of people working from the High Commissioner Office on it in each country review. They, they don't have the level of expertise and knowledge, and they don't keep track on a daily basis of what's going on in every country because they have to move from one country to another. So they really rely on civil society and NGOs for input to analyze and to understand and know what happened from one review to another. 
Uh, U.S. government reviews have been at average every six years. Uh, I mean, this is a long time. Usually it has to be around three or four years, but because of the backlog of the treaty bodies, the last review of the U.S. government was in 2006, the ICCPR review before the Human Rights Committee. And the next one will be in October of this year. So you're looking at uh, seven years uh, um, after the last review. That's a long time. Many things happen. You know, you have different administrations, you have uh, uh, many changes in, in laws and policies, et cetera. So there's a lot to capture. So what happens is really you have the submission of initial report that usually happens one year after the, US, uh, the, the government accepts or uh, ratifies the treaty. And then there's submission of periodic reports. And this is a cycle that continues uh, from the government, the time that they submit the report drafting, there's a process where the committee drafts uh, a list of issues so that from the big, long reports that government submit, the committee accepts first uh, submissions from civil society and try to prioritize the issues that they want to raise with the government when they come before the committee uh, as part of what they, it's called constructive dialogue. Um, and so they basically come up with a list of issues or questions that they want the government to be to come prepared and answer and they request uh, that these answers are provided in writing in some, most of the cases, although the procedure could change. I'm going to focus on the ICCPR, on the Human Rights Committee procedure. Uh, after the, the committee sub, uh, 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 adopts the list of issues, the, the government has two months to, to reply, and then there will be a review session. Usually it takes, uh, takes place in Geneva over... Uh, six hours, two separate sessions where uh, the government uh, presents their report and replies and there are additional questions, remarks and comments made by the committee before they adopt what, they, what we call the concluding observations. These concluding observations form the basis for follow-up between the, the committee and the U.S. government, but more importantly between civil society and the government, and we'll talk more about that. Let me run quickly through the ICCPR timeline for the U.S. review. So the U.S. fourth periodic report was submitted in 2011, okay? So it's been a while since it was submitted uh, and, and, uh, and a lot of things happened. The, the U.S. government report of uh, 700 pages, really, with the annexes uh, demonstrated in many areas uh, improvement uh, compared to 2006 review, especially in the areas of LGBT rights and civil rights enforcement under the Department of Justice. But in general, if you look at the report, it, it lacked concrete information on state and local compliance with the treaty. Um, and you will hear more about that also in the, in the, in the, the next sessions, and particularly how to engage state and local government. It ignored uh, serious ICCPR violations, uh, for example, those associated with the Occupy protests, uh, even though they happened uh, the time when the U.S. submitted the report. Um, and in some areas, the, 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 the U.S. report failed to, to answer, to provide information on measures taken since 2006, concluding observations. So what, here's what, what, what we, uh, we've been doing since... 2000, uh, December 2011. The U.S. Human Rights Network uh, created an ICCPR task force so that civil society uh, provides the necessary information to complement uh, or to uh, uh, rebut, debunk, as whatever uh, term you want, expose uh, 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 hypocrisy and double standards and lack of implementation and also commend the government for for positive good actions taken to implement the treaty uh, so the way to do this obviously NGOs could do it on their own you can just go and submit the report to the committee and show up for the review but the most effective way that we found over the past eight years and I've been involved in the last eight years in the uh, all the US reviews under the Bush administration from the, US, from the civil society side, representing the, the ACLU, the, way, the most effective way to do that is by coordinating civil society participation. 
not necessarily to agree on one voice, on one report, on one uh, answer, or one way to present uh, what we call alternative reports or shadow reports, but, re but really to make sure that we're not leaving anything unaddressed, that we provide opportunities for communities, particularly communities uh, uh, that don't necessarily have always the access to, uh, to you know, go government meetings that happen in DC or in, in the different states' capitals, to be able to raise their concerns and to raise and frame human rights violation, violations of, of, of their rights as human rights violations under the, the ICCPR. So the US Human Rights Network created a special task force uh, to coordinate this effort. Uh, the task force members represent the different geographic regions, issue areas, and constituencies. And really, what we really wanna, wanna do is to make sure that we are um, engaging diverse constituencies and doing it in a transparent way. Uh, and to hold US accountable under those uh, principles. Just to give you an example of the members of the task force, uh, you can you know, recognize some of these organizations and perhaps you worked with them or have, uh, you can see that they're all involved, involving in you know number of uh, organizations working on a range of issues and rights. Uh, and they are really been, uh, it's been really great to work with, with, uh, with all these groups and some of them have been uh, critical in uh, creating some of the resources, the information that we're putting out for uh, other organizations to join this process. Uh, just going back to the timeline. So in, after the US submitted the reports, the, the, the Human Rights Committee um, invited NGOs to submit information so that they can assess uh, the US and to uh, the, U the US report. And uh, usually the, the deadline for those submissions were in December 2012. Uh, there were over 70 submissions made to the committee. The committee uh, told us when we went to Geneva last March that it was also breaking a record for a list of issues submissions. Uh, usually they get many submissions uh, for a shadow report closer to the review, but not th at that early stage of the process. So that was an uh, important thing. I don't know if you can click on that. Is there a Wi-Fi? Yeah, if you can click on the link. Just wanted to show you the web page of the Human Rights Committee where they posted all the NGO submissions. Oh, here it is, great. So you can see, uh, and you have to scroll down to see all the submissions. So this was the 107th session, and all of these submissions came from US-based organizations. Some of them, uh, very small organizations that they needed the US Human Rights Network to help them really put their submissions and information together and were sent to uh, the committee. You can also see that many of the submissions are joint submissions. So groups came together around an issue uh, and made, 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 you know, made, made sure that they, they are not um, duplicating efforts. Uh, and this is, the, all this information was used by the committee to adopt the list of issues, which you have copy in your binders. Uh, this is the UN uh, with, the, with the UN logo. And if you have the time and go through some of those submissions, you can see uh, how these submissions influenced a, a number of the questions and the issues that were put forward to the US government uh, in at the end of the last, uh, the last Human Rights Committee session, which was in March. So after submitting all these reports to the Human Rights Committee, a number of organizations went to Geneva uh, uh, to meet with committee members and lobby them, advocate for the issues to be included in the list. And it's critical, I mean, one thing that is important to mention here is that while the, an issue, uh, if the issue is not on the list, doesn't mean that it's the end of the, the game here. Uh, we emphasize this number of groups have made submissions on important issues that were not picked up, they were not adopted by the committee. The committee is an independent body. They may have their own consideration what are the issues that they want to ask the US about. Now, that doesn't mean that if, if the issue that uh, one organization or community is concerned about is not on the list, 
that it's, it's, uh, it's game over and then, then they should not participate. In fact, uh, when we were in Geneva, a number of committee members said, we're so overwhelmed by so many issues and you know, this is a big country and there's a lot of complex issues that we, we could not really address all of them in, in, the, in, this, in the list because they have word limit and they have page limit and they have to treat all governments equally and fairly, right? So they did say, but for some of, for some of, some of us who went to Geneva and, and, uh, or submitted information, that these issues may be raised during the uh, US review in October. Uh, the two sessions that I mentioned earlier, uh, six hours where the committee members will use some of this information and drafted questions and raise them to the US delegation sitting just across from them. Uh, with uh, live cast and media presence and NGOs tweeting and what have you, okay? So the, uh, just to go uh, to give you the, the kind of the recent developments, so the, uh, the U U Human Rights Committee adopted the list of issues that you have copy of. Uh, the list was officially sent to the U.S. government on April 28th, uh, and the U.S. government indeed told us that they will be uh, trying to meet the deadline of two months, 60 days, and will be submitting their replies on June 28th. Uh, the, the bad news is that they are going to limit their submission to 30 pages, which is again a limitation from the committee. Uh, we're, trying, we're trying now to work or try to encourage them to, to maybe add an annex to make sure that there will be uh, um, uh, more space to acknowledge some of the concerns that were raised, particularly uh, from civil society during the last consultation. So if you can, um, I'm, you can, you should, and I, I encourage all of you to read the list of issues, but they really covers a lot of issues that are very timely, very important. Some of them are not addressed by Congress, by court, by other agencies or, or state and local governments, where you may find th the, the questions here and more importantly the replies and the concluding observations an important uh, opportunity for you to use them in your advocacy. So they asked about immigration detention and enforcement, including racial profiling and shooting deaths on the U.S.-Mexico border, the use of the death penalty, and surgery confinement, especially on children and persons with mental disabilities. Uh, there's a specific question on racial disparities in the criminal justice system was mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a specific question on the targeted killing program. This is the first time that the U.S. government will respond to a specific question about this uh, unlawful program, uh, uh, more questions on lack of accountability for torture, particularly in the so-called war on terror, uh, the rights of detainees at Guantanamo Bay, uh, criminalizations of homelessness, uh, an important issue that uh, even though, you know, you think uh, how, you know, how would you, how do you frame it as an ICCPR, certainly an ICCPR issue, a civil, civil political rights issue. Uh, you will not. You will be surprised to see that there was a question about gun violence, and even a specific mention on stand your ground laws. You know, the Florida uh, court is just starting to hear uh, um, the trial in, um, uh, uh, in, in, you know, with with the implications of what the stand uh, your ground laws is. Uh, there's a questions on trafficking and domestic violence, uh, measures restricting the right to vote, uh, both on the issue of felon disenfranchisement as well as voter suppression. Uh, and uh, uh, there was also a specific question on NSA surveillance program, uh, which is now also be has become very, very timely. Um, so what are we doing now next? Just last week or a couple of weeks ago, on May 30th, the US government organized a consultation with civil society. Um, I think we had over 100 organizations in the room and on the phone participating. It was really very uh, disappointing consultations because of the poor communications. Most people who were calling in couldn't hear anything that was going on in the room. There was uh, only two hours to all of the issues that were, you can see two hours to hear from, from civil society. That was really a very ambitious, uh, perhaps too much to, 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 um, to expect that that will happen. But we will be address these and other concerns that we have. We're, we're continue as a task force uh, to coordinate uh, participation, including using the list of issues to engage with, with state and local governments, particularly because this, the federal government has not taken 
they taken it fulfilled its responsibility to reach out to state and local government. There was only one time when the Obama administration sent memos to state and local governments in January 2010, inform, informing them about the uh, treaty reporting obligations and that the U.S. government will be compiling the reports under CAT, CERD, and ICCPR. As far as we know, there haven't been uh, concrete, uh, meaningful steps taken to engage with civil and local governments. And you will hear more about that also in the next uh, um, uh, day or two. Uh, we will be um, sending the letter up to the administration, particularly raising concerns about consultations. Uh, the task force is doing training calls. Uh, you know, there will be another one in July. We just had one last week. Uh, you can you could also uh, log in to the U.S. Human Rights Network. I will provide the link where you can also listen to this training where, where advocates share their experiences using shadow reporting. Uh, there will be resources and templates to, for folks to use uh, how to submit information to the committee so you're not going to be like on your own figuring how, how to do it. No formal procedures really for shadow reports. There, you can submit a 100-page report, but you can submit also very effective 5 to 10-page issue report saying, you know, here's what the U.S. have not told you uh, in the report. Here's a question that you raised. We want to provide you with another information. Here's what we expect you to ask the question during the re review and how will we, another recommendation of what the, uh, what the committee should adopt at the end of the process. Um, the official deadline for submission of shadow reports is usually three weeks before the opening session, okay? Uh, we are trying to encourage organizations to submit information as early as possible given the fact that the committee is under understaffed doesn't have the time to go over all of them, and we're, we're uh, the, the U.S. Human Rights Network again task force deadline is to submit shadow reports uh, in, uh, in August 23rd for those organizations that want help to compile and, and send them to Geneva, and then we are encouraging folks to send directly submissions to the committee by September 6th. Um, we are. Part of the plan that we developed for the coming year is to do a day of action just uh, weeks before the U.S. review. We're hoping to get a little more uh, media attention and get uh, uh, communities engaged and informed about this process by sharing some of the submissions that were made, letting folks know that the U.S. will be up for review uh, in during the October session and to, to as get as much, uh, uh, you know, uh, coordination and, and involvement and organizing around this this important uh, uh, review process. Uh, we obviously there will be be more opportunities for you to get updates, uh, including uh, coordination before uh, going to Geneva. Some groups would have will have the resources to be able to make it to Geneva, and as was mentioned earlier, it's really an informal process. Um, while we don't have a formal uh, standing to present before the committee during the review, the committee will have, uh, will set aside time for formal presentations from civil society uh, prior to the U.S. review in October. And that will happen uh, about a few days or a week before the U.S. will be reviewed by the committee. Uh, so we will coordinate uh, those and we will also try to make sure that people, even if you are not able to, to go to Geneva, uh, Luckily now, the Human Rights Committee session is live cast, so you can watch it uh, online, assuming that the time difference will not be an issue. For you, it would be more challenging. Maybe the, you, know, you have to be up uh, uh, early in the morning or you have to be too, too, too late, uh, but we'll see. Um, but that said, I think that will offer another way for folks to, to watch the review, to, uh, to interact and raise the, the kind of questions and the dynamic that will that will really uh, put the U.S. on the, spot, on the international spotlight. Uh, after the review in early November with the U.S., uh, we will get the concluding observations. This is the time for us to report back and to start thinking about strategy for implementation. Uh, we will not have time for it here, but part of what we're trying to do is not to limit the NGO participation only in the review process, because that would be really uh, just half or part of the, the importance of the review process. This, the second part, which is 
what do, what do you do with the concluding observations as was mentioned earlier is in of itself an important important process that involves not only uh, federal state and local governments also involves a lot of creativity uh, from lawyers from advocates from grassroots organizations to use those recommendations in the way that will be helpful uh, in in your uh, advocacy so I'll just leave you with uh, the emails if you want to join the US Human Rights Network ICCPR listserv uh, I promise you it's not uh, uh, you know um, an overwhelming uh, listserv uh, you, you know these emails that are posted are only relevant to the ICCPR review uh, so you could email Candace um, uh, Kaufman who who is uh, uh, the coordinating uh, the logistics from the US Human Rights Network or the ICCPR uh, US Human Rights Network website. Thank you. Oops, sorry. So I think we have like five, ten minutes uh, for questions. I know I, I covered a lot of things, so uh, feel free to ask whatever you know comes to your mind and, and things that will help you understand and, and more importantly, think about ways to, to use the, the ICCPR in your own advocacy. I could take the other. Yes, please. If you could just uh, stay, say your name. Absolutely. Um, and, th th you know, the shadow report, which I think the, the, the better uh, term is alternative report, is that is an opportunity for the, for the committee, but also for the concerned um, party, in particular the NGO or commu affected community, is to raise the issue in the context of that process. And if, if your issue or your uh, concerns are not reflected in the, on the list, or are not accurately reflected the way that you want them to be reflected. Uh, this is a good way to send information. We're encouraging folks to send brief information. Uh, you, you could do, if you're working on a report on an issue, and it's great to have a long report for, you know, and launch it and release it, you know, sometime in the next few months. But take the executive summary, five pages, with specific questions that you want the committee to ask, and recommendations that you want them to issue at the end. And put this together, it won't take a lot of your time, and send it to the committee. Again, we will share uh, a template that we developed for these submissions. We're asking folks to limit to three to five pages per issue. Um, you know, you're free to, to do it longer, but certainly if your issue is not on the list, uh, you're, you're, you're very much encouraged to, to do so. And more importantly, to look at, um, to, re to coordinate with other groups that may be also looking at the same issue uh, so that you maximize the, the, the impact that your submission will have. If the committee sees that there are coalition of organizations submitting uh, a shadow report on an issue that is not on the list, I think they're more likely to take it up during the review. And it happened in the past, and I tell you, the issue of border killings at the U.S.-Mexico border, over militarization of the U.S.-Mexico border was not on the list of issues in 2006. And when we were in Geneva, we worked with communities on the U.S.-Mexico border from El Paso and other places, and we made sure we raised it with a committee member from Argentina, and he raised the issue, and it got to the list of issues. Now, once you, the issue is on the list, on the recommendations, it makes it to the list of issues, and then that way you keep the pressure on the government to provide, to, to to provide answers, truthful answers, uh, to the issues that is raised. Yes. No, I, I just thought it was important that since we spend so much time on reservations that people know that the committee does not accept the reservations of the United States and will address the issue notwithstanding whatever reservations might be. In fact, they're soundly critical of the United States for many of the reservations that they've adopted. So. Uh, actually, uh, it's better not to know about them. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Alberto. For, I mean, I could spend an hour just speaking about the reservations, understanding and declarations. And I can tell you, when we were in Geneva last March, uh, I raised the issue of the reservations, particularly uh, uh, the, 
the way that they are, uh, they're not reflected or there's no action taken by the U.S. government, uh, the committee member who's leading uh, will be leading the, the, the questioning on, on, the, on behalf of the committee. He's a, a legal jurist from Switzerland. He immediately said, this is covered. This is something that we'll be taking up for sure with the committee. You don't have to worry about it. And as you can see from the list of issues, it's actually on the uh, number three, uh, two, three. Uh, please clarify whether the State Department will review its, rev its reservations to the covenant with the view to withdrawing them. And the past, and the past uh, uh, review, uh, they were, there was a long debate uh, and discussion on, on the reservation, but not only on the reservations. The U.S. has not entered the reservation on the extraterritorial application. It was only mentioned in the initial report to the committee back in, in the 90s. There was no, uh, the U.S. government, when it, it ratified the treaty, did not say to the committee, oh, we're and our understanding of the extraterritorial application is only limited to U.S. territory. Uh, and it is also in, 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 a, uh, in, in not uh, in agreement with the committee. In fact, not in agreement with the, with the majority um, of, of authorities on international human rights, particularly on the ICCPR. Uh, so we'll, we'll definitely be that, and thank you for, for uh, clarifying it. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. I noticed that Alberto said that um, with CERD, people had raised the issue of corporations acting internationally. And, uh, but when I was reading what you said about the application of the ICCPR, it looked like something like that wouldn't be covered. Corporations acting internationally or even U.S. agencies that operate in other countries that certainly are not part of U.S. territory, like operations in, in Africa with private corporations or things like that. Is that something that could be raised in the shadow report, or is it just so far outside the scope? Yes, it could be raised, although, uh, the, uh, again, the, the U.S. Will, will, will say, look, you know, there's, uh, we, this is what we accepted as obligations. Mm -hmm. And uh, to the extent that, for example, the extent that the ICCPR could be uh, used to hold accountable private entities, mm -hmm. Uh, that's another thing that will be raised with the committee. So it's, it's, I think it's definitely an issue that will, will, will should be addressed. Now, I can tell you that it's not only people think that it's the extraterritorial issue is only about the so-called you know counterterrorism or war on terror uh, related stuff. It's not, mm -hmm. uh, because if you look at, for example, what the U.S. Uh, drug inform enforcement agency is doing in Latin America in Honduras and other countries, you know, clearly deploying uh, acts of uh, actors, U.S. actors, you know, uh, government ass assets, including U.S. State Department helicopter that shot and killed a pregnant woman and another child, you know, in an operation, a drug operation. Now, if that's not covered by the ICCPR, what is covered? Another thing I can tell you that is going to be c controversial, and the U.S. Uh, will probably raise that, if the U.S. Border for Patrol shot at uh, a, a Mexican national on the uh, Mexican side of the border, the U.S. would say, um, I mean, they didn't come up yet with, uh, with the ICCPR, but we'll see what it will say. Uh, to what extent the ICCPR applies? And in litigation, the U.S. government argued that it doesn't have extraterritorial application, even though the, bo the border agent was on the U.S. side of the border and shot and killed a Mexican national who was, in that case, uh, throwing rocks. It wasn't even uh, the question of imminent, uh, you know, whether it's co posing any imminent danger to the, was, was, is it also questionable. So there were all these questions that will be raised, certainly because of the NSA surveillance program, where, you know, the privacy interests or privacy protections, not only of Americans, you know, it's not only, th that's the beauty of international human rights. You, you break the ceiling of uh, the U.S. Constitution and you say, well, it's not only about the U.S. Constitution protection. It goes beyond that. The U.S. Constitution for many of the human rights advocates is the floor, not the ceiling. And that's what we say. You can add freedom and liberty, but you can't take it. So that's why, for example, in my organization, the ACLU, we are, uh, we stand for freedom of expression, freedom of speech under the First Amendment, and we don't think that we should take uh, away freedom of speech uh, and restrict them under international law, for example. It's, um, 
it's what, but certainly in the er area, other areas, this is going to be an issue where the U.S. Um, is not is, is ignoring its obligation under international human rights law. Uh, targeted killings similarly put the U.S. in a very difficult position, uh, where there's no armed conflict, where there's no uh, conventional battle battlefield uh, outside Afghanistan, and you go to Yemen and you use uh, force, lethal force, to target individuals in the country that you are not at war with and there's no uh, a conventional battlefield, uh, what is the relevance of the ICCPR there that addresses the right to life? That's why when we raised it with the committee, the committee asked the question about it in the right to life context. Uh, so there's all these complex issues that will be raised. Uh, I hope that by the time the U.S. appears before the committee, there will be uh, they will be. Uh, they will provide answers that will not, you know, uh, undermine the the progress that was made at least in terms of acknowledging some of the developments in the international human rights uh, movement. The U.S. report on the ex issue of extraterritoriality um, try to kind of state in a language that's more kind of a neutral language, while the U.S. government continues to believe that the ICCPR doesn't apply overseas, but we are mindful of the authority, the, the Human Rights Committee interpretation of the committee and the International Court of Justice uh, jurisdiction on, on this issue. So they're not trying to, to, to kind of make it more confrontational issue, but um, ultimately uh, it has uh, significant ramifications on U.S. conduct overseas. And uh, uh, at least the human rights community that's been advocating for the ICCPR overseas has been saying the conduct-based approach should be adopted. It's not only if the person is under in your territory and in your jurisdiction. Uh, it does, doesn't make sense. So we, sh we highlighted the history of, of negotiating the treaty, even when the time when Eleanor Roosevelt was the head of the U.S. delegation. And she asked the question, well, does it mean that if our citizens, uh, we have to care for our for people who are under U.S. Oc occupation in Japan? And you're talking about post-World War II. And the negotiations, if you look at the record, clearly says that the understanding of the international community, at least the governments that negotiated the treaty, was to, to make sure that they take responsibility for actions that are involving their actors and you know, their, their behavior, conduct uh, abroad. Not necessarily that you have to take care of your citizens and their rights when they live overseas. Because otherwise that doesn't make any sense if you just say, oh, it's limiting to, uh, to you know, U.S. jurisdiction and territory. Yeah, hi, I'm Jeffrey Stauffer. I've um, worked with uh, Alberto a lot uh, representing Alaska villages. And, and uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about that, uh, the federalism problem that you brought up. And, and uh, in particularly in trying to enforce some of these uh, things in, on a local and a state level, uh, we run into this all the time, um, different mechanisms, different um, states and local governments always say, well, this doesn't apply to us. It's, it's, you know, your, your problem is with the federal government. Um, and I, I um, you know, one thing that we've, we've done a lot, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've uh, really pushed the issue of, of, you know, as a state and federal uh, local government, you're a political subdivision of the United States. You're not. You're not. Uh, you're not cut out from these things. You don't have no obligation. You have the same obligations as, as the United States. It applies to you all the way down. Um, and I just wonder what, what what your feeling was that as far as the ICCPR is. Uh, yeah, I think I think you're raising a very important one. In fact, there's a, there's a, I think at the end at one of the if you look at article. Article 50 of the ICCPR. Clearly, you know, people don't read after the Article 26, 27. They stop reading because it's all procedures about you know how the Human Rights Committee, the reporting, and all that boring stuff. But Article 50 talks about the provision says the provisions of the present covenant shall extend to all parts of the federal state without any limitations or ex exception. There's nothing clearer than uh, nothing clearer than this kind of language. And that's why the U.S. has to enter the understanding regarding federalism, uh, which I think 
compared to what we've been seeing uh, in terms of amendments and uh, RUDs, reservations, understanding, and declaration in the Senate uh, for the CRPD is relatively much better than what we, you know, much better than, you know, compared to just to kept it in a way that will not absolve the, the federal government from, from uh, obligations, but at the same time, you know, clarifies the federal structure of the United States. So I think that there's an opening there. The, as, you, as you know from your work and experience, it's really uh, a, a pre uh, excuse for government to say, well, that's not to do with us. The US government, the federal government, uh, is responsible for interacting with those international actors, has now no re relevance to us. And I think there is more uh, uh, willingness on the part of the international human rights actors. And I think Colin mentioned the Special Rapporteur on Water. It's stretching the envelope and even trying to directly interact with state and local government. And w sometimes with the federal government, uh, some people who may understand uh, the, the importance of that kind of dialogue, there could be a potential for better, uh, you know, we could do more progress. The death penalty issue is similarly a, a the same thing. The State Department would receive all the, all the, and you could hear from, from the session afterwards on the Inter-American Commission, all these uh, precautionary measures with regard to people who were about to be executed in the United States. And the State Department had, you know, said, well, this is a state issue. It's not under federal, federal, uh, federal death penalty. It's a state de death penalty in the state trial that where this person is being about to be executed. So they forward it to the, gov the local government. Now, recently, they've been trying to do a little bit more than that. They would, you know, use that and maybe to inform if there's a proceeding before the Supreme Court to use it in an amicus intervention. There's a lot of other ways to do that. But at the same time, I think international actors human rights bodies, the Inter-American Commission, understand the complexities of it, and they are ready with civil society, with advocacy community, to work on creative ways to go around it and to make an impact. Not just, okay, we'll get a headline in the newspaper. No, but really to show, I mean, another thing that we, we have to start to talk about is this incentive. What would, you know, what is the local state government incentive uh, to uh, comply with international human rights? Forget about you know, whether they have, they, they're, they want to do something with the, state, with the State Department or the federal government or not. Many of the cities, certainly California, has, you know, in international investors, you know, tourism, what have you. And I was like, if you just have those kind of inf incentives and create campaigns where the human rights it is, is, the, is the, uh, the focus of holding the state and local governments accountable. You know, could you imagine if in people who are going to Orlando to the Disney, Every, every day they would see a campaign on human rights in Florida on voting rights, on criminal justice, on the death penalty. Yeah, they are now trying to execute people because they want to save money. I mean, it's just those kinds of things that we have to think outside the box. And not everything in a, I mean, for litigators, obviously, there's a little bit more uh, challenging, you know, how to bring it to court. But there is still much we can talk more about it maybe off, off, uh, offline. Uh, we were planning to do a breakout session so that we can have two groups just to, one would look at uh, federal policy, federal mm -hmm. programs that have an impact on state and local, uh, and, and then um, another group to discuss state uh, and local uh, issues and how the ICCPR could be relevant to your advocacy and work. And we're just looking at the time and see whether that's going to be realistic uh, to break out and then come back and use that as an opportunity. We could. We could either do that for 15 minutes or we can just take more questions and comments and others who have experience, you know, Risa and David, who want to weigh in just to share and offer a comment, uh, please do so. I don't, you know, if you yeah. yeah? That works too. I don't have much to eat today, so I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that one should work. Hi, my name is Mitra Abadalahi. I am the border litigation staff attorney at the ACLU of San Diego. Hi, Jamil. Um, I worked with Jamil until about a month ago. Uh, m one of the questions I have is we received a grant to create this new border litigation position and then leverage that grant to 
get a second grant to create a border litigation position in Arizona. And we're trying to do that, again, for New Mexico and Texas. Um, with the idea that a lot of the issues that have recurred at the border have eluded meaningful reform because there hasn't been the threat of litigation, unfortunately. And so I'm, I'm a latecomer to an advocacy movement that has been going on for 30 or 40 years. And listening to uh, your presentation and realizing that, for example, border killings are one of the on the list of issues that will actually be addressed, we're super excited. My colleague Gabriela and I are super excited about being able to contribute or to learn from those who are engaged in advocacy in uh, preparation for that meeting in October. And my question is, how do people who are just coming onto an issue, like me, for example, figure out who is writing shadow reports on issues that they also um, are working on and make themselves available as a resource or a colleague who can help share that burden? Because I just, I don't even know where to start by identifying who I should talk to to make sure that I can be of assistance if possible. Great, great question, Mitra. And uh, we're equally excited uh, that, you know, there are more and more uh, groups in, particularly on the U.S.-Mexico border, looking at violation of human rights and trying to use every avenue. Uh, my answer, my quick answer would be we should email um, either me, Nasrina from the a ACS, um, you know, from, uh, yeah, the uh, Asian Co Law Caucus, AL ALC, uh, or Candace. We do have uh, now a chart of all the groups that are working around uh, we call it cluster groups working around specific issues, and we will share this information with you all. Uh, even if you're not going to email me afterwards, I will make sure that to Lisa we'll do a follow-up email and uh, provide the templates, the the chart, so you can see who's doing on what, um, and answer any questions afterwards as you may have. But I, I I can tell you that in terms of the border killings, we are um, the the consultation that took place two weeks ago, um, uh, the ACLU of New Mexico, uh, Brian Erickson, who's a policy advocate at the, at the affiliate, working very closely with uh, border communities and groups working on border accountability, presented at the consultation uh, just an update on what we submitted to the committee as part of the ACLU shadow uh, up, uh, submission to the committee from December 2012. We have plans, I think other groups also may have plans to, to uh, provide more updates and add information to the committee. So we'll definitely, this is, I, I guarantee you, this is going to be an, an important issue. And w depending on what happens with, well, regardless of what happened with CRR and the comprehensive immigration reform and the bill in Congress, certainly the committee will be interested in those issues. And there are actually committee members from uh, the region, from the Latin American, uh, uh, aware and will be raising those questions. Can I just ask one quick follow-up? Um, I wanted to just quickly mention before I forget that um, on that point about continued kind of um, collaboration or information, if you look at the bottom of your agenda on the back side, there's a URL for where all of the training materials are online in a, in a publicly accessible Dropbox folder. So, for example, some of the um, handouts that Jamil referenced on the CD are not the most up-to-date, but in that Dropbox folder, they're absolutely up-to-date. And that's also where we can put um, other resources that you mentioned that you might be interested in, like shadow reports um, that we can share. So just keep track of that <laughs> URL. Um, I just wanted to, uh, Risa just reminded me that it would be important to highlight, you know, in the, in the list of issues that you have a copy in front of you, uh, in the beginning, the committee raises uh, what they call constitutional legal framework questions. And one of the specific questions really, uh, 21C, uh, 21, sorry, uh, B, uh, specifically addresses the issues of state and local implementation. It says, which measures have taken uh, by the government to ensure that the covenant is fully implemented by state and local authorities? Uh, so that's, you know, if you're working on an issue in addition to addressing the substantive areas or the area that you, you're interested in, it would be important to also raise the way uh, that the committee could uh, encourage or recommend to the committee to, to adopt or to fully implement the, the ICCPR on the state and local level. I think Columbia Human Rights Institute is also coordinating a shadow report with, uh, with a number of uh, local and state uh, human rights commissions. Uh,
I think it's great to doc document examples where state and local officials say that they don't know about the treaty, they don't know what they're supposed to do, this is something that's you know in the purview of the State Department. Um, and so uh, documenting those in the shadow report or if you want to coordinate with um, the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School, we are happy to include those in our shadow report also to continue to put, there's been a lot of advocacy with the federal government and with the treaty bodies to really encourage better coordination and implementation at the state and local level. Right. One, one other thing that we are sharing, and we will be sending it with a f in a follow-up email, is there's a, a template letter that we drafted for state and local organizations to raise with their, uh, with policymakers, with legislatures, with governors, attorney generals, whoever you are dealing with, and you can tweak the letter to your issue. But essentially, the letter will basically provide information on the current review. Uh, and raise the importance of state and local governments to, to provide input and be part of that process. And use it, you can use it to, to, to continue to engage on your issue with the state and local government. Uh, again, with perhaps creativity around incentives and why they sh really should do it, even if they're short of money. How, you know, maybe they can do it without have to, to you know, create a budget problem for, for them. Because most of the time we hear the, the answer, oh, we don't have the money. We don't have the expertise, you know. We, we don't have the department to do it. Or you we can't. We don't have the, the authority to do it. So we those those questions. We have a number of uh, uh, organizations have been working on it, and Risa has been leading uh, this effort to provide good answers to these questions and offer suggestions for governments, local state governments, to to be part of that process. And even, even if they want to do it, I think obviously there's always the possibility of a backlash where you know state and local government, we saw that in the UPR process. When the US government submitted the report to the Universal Periodic Review in 2010, they mentioned just in passing one sentence that the US government is, in, uh, is also involved in, in some litigation around anti-immigrant measures that, that were passed, including the one SB 1070 in Arizona. They didn't say anything more controversial than that. And yet, at the time, acting governors uh, uh, took that issue and sent uh, a letter of complaint to, the, to Hillary Clinton. How dare you mention Arizona and SB 1070 in the letter, and we want the State Department, the US government, to correct the, the report so that it, we want to represent our issues. It's not that your business, like mind your business kind of thing. And so it was, in a way, well, that's, let's have that debate. And let's not shy away from it. Uh, well, we have to be equipped with good answers and to make sure that we are going to provide answers to people. So, so really, what's the, what's the UN role in this? Because there's anti-UN sentiments you know, across the nation. There are people, everything that is international seems suspect and all these conspiracy about you know, uh, the invading US sovereignty and, and not to mention the anti-Sharia and international foreign law measures. They have a lot of other, you know, there's a movement against our effort to try to, to do what is common sense, which is if there is really good uh, advice that's coming from another country or another international body, what is it, why is it a bad idea to consider it, whether by, by judges or by policymakers? And that's done regularly. I mean, if, if there's any problem, you know, see people hear about in every area except for individual rights and human rights. Every fo everything that is foreign, you know, we, we, don't, we don't see it as a welcome thing. So we, we really encourage you to, to think about the possibilities, but at the same time to be realistic about what we can do and to be prepared for these kinds of uh, sometimes backlashes and, 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 and pushbacks from, from people who, who don't want to engage in international human rights uh, system, don't want to be part of that. Uh, they, they see it as, as certainly in, in, you know, in, in something that is you know, un-American or, 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 uh, or not helpful. Yes? So this is a question I struggle with a lot. Um, this work can be very slow, uh, sometimes a little tedious. How do you measure success and can maybe, and this is a question for everyone you know, that's been speaking, you know, how do you measure success and maybe share a few really successful endeavors that you can point to that make a difference in people's lives? A great, great question. I, I think that... Um, I'm asking I think you because I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, the, the way that we, we try to measure success is on a number of grounds uh, or fronts. First of all, 
you know, the level of, un um, of, of awareness, understanding, and knowledge that people have, both in civil society and in government, uh, uh, you know, affected community members, that th th just to know that these instruments uh, exist, relevant, could be effective. I say could because they could be not effective in some areas where you're not going to choose to go international on an issue for whatever reason. But there's also the other factor is in particular areas where, where you've seen success stories where there's ha something happened as a result of the international pressure or international pressure or because of in addition to the international advocacy that so you've been doing the, the local advocacy, you've been doing the federal advocacy around an issue, but you add an international advocacy to it as a complementary way. So not necessarily going to be, oh, this the whole thing will change the policy, but we'll have uh, some success in showing that the, you know, the international pressure um, made a difference. Uh, in some areas, like in housing rights, you know, we have uh, a colleague, Eric Tars, who's been working with HUD around uh, policy of, of HUD around housing rights issues. And in guidance, in internal guidance that the, that the agency, you know, uh, cited and ref reflected on the international human rights standard right to housing, for example, which is far from, you know, what the U.S. would accept as a legal obligation. Um, similarly, we have created now as uh, after years of, of advocacy in the context of CERD, there's an equality working group that the U.S. government has created to look at ways to implement the International Covenant on all forms of racial discrimination, the CERD, with interagency uh, uh, representation. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not ideal, it's not perfect, it's not what we think we you know, there should be more, but that is, you know, one step forward. Uh, similarly, on the local and state level, there's a number of initiatives, certainly, the, you know, the CEDAW, uh, you know, the commission that you, you are uh, leading and you're working uh, uh, is an important example that, you know, uh, people all over the country, I think, uh, cite as a good example of making progress despite the failure on the national level to ratify CEDAW. You can still use CEDAW to, to pass ordinances, to, to, to do the auditing and to do all other work that will be relevant. So I think it's hard to say, you know, how do we assess? I think it'd be... To me, I mean, the, the, it, it's not one one magic way of doing it, but the fact that is now, um, you know, the SB 1070 litigation really was in part because of international pressure. If you remember when the state uh, Secretary of State announced that the U.S. government is going to sue S, uh, Arizona, it was it was Hillary that announced that, not the Justice Department. And you know why? Because she was been hearing a lot from international. Uh, uh, bodies, including uh, Latin American countries about that, and they were briefed by civil society. They were briefed by, by a number of uh, reviews, including CERD and other one. So never, I think all of that has to come together. You know, the, the death penalty um, is, is also part of it. it there's, there's a specific movement, there's specific areas where we're seeing more progress made because of adding the international human right uh, pressure uh, holding U.S. accountable to its to its commitment and obligation, and and that's again uh, will only grow, and will I, mean, I'm, I think that the, we're just beginning of that of that of, of, of perfecting what we what we started, you know, and, and and you know groups like NAACP historically been on the forefront of this struggle. They are the ones who first went to the United Nations, the end of the 40s, the beginning of the 50s. Uh, you know, calling attention to and uh, lynching and Jim Crow laws and policies in southern states in particular. Now, after years that they've been struggling with civil rights laws and policies that didn't obviously realize the uh, all the people's rights under you know the U.S. Constitution and state is you know the and, and, and Congress Congress uh, um, congressional action. Now they're back to using international human rights. In the past year, they sent two major delegations to the UN Human Rights Council just speak to talk about voting rights, voter suppression laws. And you know what? Maybe it's not, this is just, maybe they're not going to help, you know, use, uh, get, get to a final uh, uh, conclusion in one, one thing, but all of this together, I think we're making an impact. Thank you. Hi, 
I just want to quickly respond to that question. My name is Angie Rosga, and I work with um, consulting firm Transpositions uh, Consulting, and we do evaluation research. And there's actually a, a whole bunch of new methods out on advocacy evaluation, trying to evaluate things that take a long time, that are longer than a year-long grant cycle. Um, and so if anybody's interested, just let me know, and I'll, I can email you sites. There's a genera generational shift coming, too. Uh, the, the generation behind us uh, don't see the world the way these generations in front of us do. Um, and it's, it's coming whether they want it or not. And, and I think it's time, but that means we can't drop the ball now. We have to keep pushing because the younger generations are going to be in a much better position to implement this on a domestic level. As, as complicated as that process is, you mean, mentioned the, the UPR. I wanted to ask, there's so much going on in the UN and all of these rights are tied together. So how much are you, how much is this uh, committee process also, how much do the issues carry over and the same people work on the UPR process? And, and also, are you all thinking about the post-2015 UN development goals? I mean, it's such a huge rock because that was one of the challenges, as I mentioned in the beginning. So is there, are you, is, are people think, I'm sure you're thinking about big, bigger picture and how, how these issues can be brought up consistently over all of the forums yeah. in the UN? It's a great question. Again, I, I think a um, few years ago when we did the 2006, the CAT and the uh, uh, ICCPR and the CERD in 2008, we did ad hoc kind of uh, coordination. So people in groups were, came together and coordinated and we felt that, and, and we created good examples. In fact, they were cited by committee members as exemplary of you know, how civil society could interact. Uh, we did in the past year or two, we are trying now to put this all in, um, in a more permanent structure that the US Human Rights Network is coordinating. So I, I spoke and told you about the ICCPR task force. In fact, there's a task force for each review, UN review process. Uh, the ICCPR, CAT, CERD and the UPR, some of these uh, are informing, information. So they're, they're this, the CATS uh, task force is not fully constituted yet. But we created a model for creating a task force that where members of civil society, diverse, presenting different issues, constituency, come together with a commitment uh, to do this work. But then under the umbrella of what the US Human Rights Network is now calling the international uh, um, IMCC, the International M Monitoring um, International Monitoring Com Mechanisms. Uh, so the, uh, the idea is that the, all of these are being coordinated together. So the task forces are communicating through their co-chairs. So every month we have a meeting between the co-chairs of the ICCPR, the CAT, and the CERD and the UPR is now about to be formed so that we are not every time reinventing the wheel. We're not wasting time duplicating efforts. We are seeing opportunities and sharing experiences and bringing this uh, to everybody in the movement. So it's not like, oh, because you have someone who has good experience in human rights, then you're doing a good job and others are left behind. No, everybody, we're helping everybody to get that kind of knowledge and experience and to be part of it. And, and to maintain the unique voices of different organizations to the extent possible, which is hard, you know. Uh, and you know, I, I, I think that the ACLU is, is, is should, you know, sometimes we, we, are, we have more resources, we have more representation in the states, we, we have more people, you know, working on multi-issues. It doesn't mean that we have to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to take, you know, charge of everything, but we have to, to play uh, more, uh, you know, uh, team effort role in order to bring this forward. So that's that's what's happening now. So if you're interested in any of those, we'll make sure to link you to the different task forces. And uh, th there is a international human rights mechanism listserv where general international mechanism related uh, things are shared. You could subscribe to. 
Uh, and ultimately, we are trying to push the U.S. government to, to create both the federal, state, and local government um, uh, both uh, uh, mechanisms within the government and outside the government to monitor and enforce international human rights, in addition to the civil society pressure. Uh, there's an effort that's still it has been for four years now within uh, as part of the Human Rights at Home campaign where the network is now going to step up their leadership and to, to, uh, to continue the work where we are calling for the federal government to issue an executive order on implementing human rights, which will be more robust, more uh, expanded than the one that was issued in 1998. By the way, it's mentioned in the list, list of issues. If you look at, uh, uh, at question 2C, uh, 21C, uh, the committee raised that because we shared it with the committee. We said we want you to ask the U.S. government about where, what are they doing to reinvigorate Executive Order 13107, which was issued first by the Clinton administration in 98 and disbanded by the Bush administration in 2001. Um, and we want to see better coordination around in, in the federal government. There's also a movement to create a national human rights institution uh, or a national human rights commission that will be independent of the government. Over 100 countries have those kinds of bodies that really bridge the gap between civil society and government, but they are in the middle, but they are independent. Also, there's a question about that here. So there's all these efforts that are all combined, and you will see in our templates and resources that we created, we're encouraging people to cite previous recommendations from CERD, even if you are talking about ICCPR, because it's all interrelated now. Even if the, you have a recommendation from the UPR, cite it. Make, make, um, remind the government and the committee of the commitment that was undertaken by the U.S. government in that process. So that's kind of the process of accountability that is you know, becoming better and better. And I think by, by December of this year, we're hoping that the U.S. Human Rights Network will be able to um, formally uh, announce the, the full functioning of all these uh, task forces under this structure so that it will grow and then think about other ways to engage state and local grassroots organizations and advocacy organizations on the state level. You could, you could create similar campaigns on the state level to, to do that. Uh, and then, you know, so it won't be like only oh, nationally and goes down. No, it could, it could be really from top, uh, from bottom up accountability effort that would look at ICCPR and CAT. And some, in some states, there are some interesting, you know, uh, initiatives. Well, I think that's all the time that we have, so thank you very much.